So, first of all, it's, uh, it's my honor and privilege to uh, welcome the future leaders of Italy here in uh, the beautiful city of Chicago at the University of Chicago. Um, first of all, the, the city of Chicago, as you see, is always very sunny, is one of the most uh, best kept secrets of the United States. Uh, we call it uh, the flyover land because people go to New York, they go to San Francisco, they just forget this part of the country. But this part of the country is beautiful, and I strongly encourage you, if you have the time, tonight to go to the Promontory Point and see from here the skyline of Chicago. It's one of the most beautiful views you can see in the United States. And quoting a great uh, and very famous Italian, when uh, Benigni came here, he said, uh, <clears throat> when you see Chicago, uh, you are reminded of Schopenhauer that say that architecture is frozen music. And uh, seeing the skyline of Chicago, especially during the winter, you are reminded of this idea of uh, frozen music. It's really sort of uh, a beautiful thing. The second thing that I want to emphasize is uh, the welcome here at the University of Chicago. In a, in a moment which is uh, uh, difficult for everybody, I want to remind the tradition of welcoming diversity at the University of Chicago. Um, many, many, many people don't know that Chicago was founded by uh, money given by Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller used to live in Cleveland and uh, was thinking about giving him his money to uh, Case Western, uh, now a little known university in Cleveland. And uh, then he got pissed at the fact that his wife was not allowed to be buried in the same cemetery, in the main cemetery of town, because she was of a different religious denomination. And we're talking about different Christian denomination. We're not talking about anything uh, more exotic. So, uh, and he got pissed and gave money to a, a new university that got founded uh, back then. It was the University of Chicago. And the first president of the University of Chicago, because he was trying to catch up against uh, sort of uh, uh, the incumbents in the East, uh, followed a strategy that later sort of uh, Gary Becker will uh, rationalize, which is when you are trying to catch up, you actually seek actively uh, minorities that are left out. So he actually went out and hired uh, mostly Jewish people, because at the time there was a strong discrimination against Jewish people in the United States. And so the reason why the University of Chicago traditionally had a gigantic component of uh, Jewish faculty is because of that. And that made, uh, put sort of Chicago on the map uh, pretty, pretty quickly. And uh, uh, even in the 50s, when uh, Jewish people were still discriminating in this country, there is a joke or a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, but at least it's sort of likely, of a job market candidate who sort of uh, comes to Chicago, presents, does a very good seminar, then goes to dinner with the faculty. And uh, <clears throat> in the middle of dinner, after a few glasses, has the courage to say, say, what is your quota for Jewish people? Because at the time, there was a, basically an unwritten quota. Um, and they said uh, 95%. And um, since then, of course, we have diversified. And uh, I am proud to say that only in the finance group at Booth uh, which contains 20 people, with four Italians. Uh, and uh, we have a Muslim, we have two Orthodox, we have all the variety possible in the world, which is what makes this place so vibrant. And uh, I think uh, immigration and diversity have been the secret of the University of Chicago and is a lesson that is important to uh, remember these days. Um, <laughs> But I said uh, very clearly that I welcome the future leaders of Italy. And this is uh, really a, a wish uh, in both sense, uh, a wish uh, uh, for Italy uh, that could get uh, such talented people back to improve the country, I think is desperately needed. And uh, just seeing how this conference was organized, because I have to say, I take the privilege of sort of hosting and welcoming you here, but I've done nothing. All this has been done by uh, the students and they've been fantastic, and they've shown real leadership in doing that uh, at the same time as taking classes, recruiting, and doing a lot of other things. So they have shown the ability to be effective leaders, and I hope they will apply this talent to Italy, and I hope that they will be able and willing to go back to Italy to apply this talent. I think that, uh, as I said, our country uh, desperately uh, need it. 
But uh, the traditional Chicago is also to be uh, a bit substantive, so you're not going to get away with it just with a welcome. You're going to have some uh, data and some thoughts. And uh, the, the thoughts and the data I want to stress regards uh, what I call curing the Italian disease. So first of all, let's try to make sure that we are on the same page about the existence of a disease. So most people have focused their attention on what happened since the crisis. I want to tell you that the problems are much uh, older, unfortunately, than the crisis. So in this graph, you see uh, the period that goes from uh, the mid-90s to 2007, so it's pre-crisis, and decompose the uh, increase in uh, income per capita uh, between uh, the uh, ratio between employment and population, whether more people work or, or, or not, uh, the number of hours that people put uh, when they work, and finally, what we really care about, the source of all the improvements in our lifestyle, which is productivity. Output per hour work. And what you see is that uh, basically Italy is at the bottom of the distribution, the black part, for the increase in sort of our, um, sorry, in, uh, no, no, in the, the GDP per hour is not the, the black part, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, is the shaded, uh, not the gray, not the black, the other thing, I don't know how to call it. The increase in productivity in sort of GDP per hour work, uh, Italy had over that period a very small increase in that productivity, smaller than basically any other developed country. The only one that did worse than us is Spain, and I'm gonna come back to that uh, why that's the case. But so the real problem of Italy is uh, the slow productivity growth that has been with us way before the financial crisis. And this is uh, putting in data something uh, that I've shown with the graph. Uh, Italy has a gap of 20% uh, with respect to the other European countries over this period uh, in terms of uh, uh, labor productivity, and as you can see, even if you adjust for capital, most people say, oh, this is because Italy invests uh, too little. And what you see is that, uh, yes, uh, investment uh, are part of it. Uh, if you adjust for investment, total productivity growth adjust for capital, uh, the gap becomes a little bit lower, lower, but it's still a very large gap, something we have to contend with. So. Let me be very, very quick because I don't have time, but uh, all the stories that you heard uh, about Italy being uh, uh, inefficient, especially the public sector, about being corrupt, about uh, not having labor flexibility, about low human capital, all these stories are true, but they don't explain a fact. Until 1995, Italy grew roughly at the same pace as everybody else. In the middle of the 90s, Italy stopped, okay? And uh, you, most of you are young. The one who are less young, like me, remember that in the 90s or in the 80s, Italy was not any better in any of this sort of uh, dimension. So uh, for those of, uh, of you that have heard maybe their parents say, oh, but in the old days things were better, I can tell you, I don't know how old your parents are, but the old days I remember were no better than today. Okay, so all this stuff has been around for us for a long time. It's stuff we have to fix. I'm not saying we don't have to fix, but it's not what explains the uh, lack of productivity growth in Italy, including, including the lack of labor flexi flexibility. So if this is the thing, what it is that is the problem? So in the mid-90s, a lot of things happen, but one in particular I think is important and goes under the name of information and communication technology revolution. Uh, was more pronounced in the United States that in fact in the 90s grew in terms of productivity at a rate much faster than Europe. Uh, but also in Europe, we experienced that revolution and in Italy, we are somehow behind in that revolution. Now, what is so special about ICT? To explain, I have to go to a very interesting story. The picture you see here is of William Bratton, who was the New York police commissioner that actually fixed crime in New York. Uh, everybody sort of uh, gives the credit to, to Rudolf Giuliani, but uh, the police commissioner actually did it 
was this guy. And how did he do it? He merged technology with management. So he imported massively uh, the use of data in uh, management of the local police. However, uh, a study of a former colleague uh, shows that investing in ICT is completely useless unless you have good management, unless you have a combination of what we call professional management. So measurable goals, internal accountability, minimal management empowerments, and rewards. And the study that is quoted there shows that across the United States, uh, no matter how much you invest in ICT, the impact on lower crime, and this is, by the way, is a big, big problem for Chicago. Chicago is the outlier in this, in this trend, is as a dramatic problem of crime. Uh, actually, very close nearby here is where one of the places in America where people die the most. So it's really something very, very important. And uh, here we show that the combination of uh, good management and ICT is what might fix the problem, but ICT alone does not. And uh, if we think about good management, one of the mentioned good management is promotion of the more talented people, accountability of the people at the top, and so on, so on and so forth. And uh, some studies have tried to compare how these practices are diffused across developed countries. And uh, you notice that at the bottom of this distribution are the two countries that do the worst in terms of improvement in productivity over uh, the last 20 years. And at the top, not surprisingly, we have the, uh, the northern European countries that have done so well in recent years. And this idea is actually supported by the data. What I've done with a, with a co-author, we have looked at sort of uh, the trend in productivity growth across European countries for sectors that are high CT incentive, intensive and sectors that are not, and in countries that are highly meritocratic and in countries that are not. And what you see is that before 1995, before the ICT revolution, basically uh, things were going along fine for everybody, okay? And then there is a big divergence after 1995. The green line are sectors that are ICT in intensive in countries that are highly meritocratic. This is, the green line is what Italy is missing. In those sectors, we're falling behind. And why? Is not only we don't invest enough in ICT, is the investment, like in those police departments where there was no good management, don't pay off because there is not the ICT. Now, in case you sort of uh, uh, are worried to say, why on earth Italy is so not meritocratic and why in other countries there is not much more meritocracy? Now, this is a, a difficult picture to explain. Let me give you sort of a, a, a simple explanation. What I have on the x-axis is a measure of how much uh, competition there is. So the higher the number uh, and the less competition there is, and the lower the number is the, uh, the more competition there is in the system. And what you see is, not surprisingly, you have more meritocracy in more competitive sector, less meritocracy in less competitive sector. So I don't want to sort of insult one of the organizers who is not related, uh, but uh, Italy looks very much like this picture. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful ship. A, the pride of Italian technology destroyed by bad management. So I want you to memorize this picture because really represent both what is great about our country and what is terrible about our country. This, this ship is one of the most advanced, if not the most advanced ship in the world. Italy is able to build these ships and uh, they are the pride of our nation. But no matter how good the ship is, if you don't have a good captain, this is the outcome. And let's not blame just Schettino. There is a failure in management here, in control, in compliance, 
in a failure that goes up the ladder in the distribution. So now the question is, what can you do to fix it? Okay, and uh, I don't want to just uh, give uh, bad news. I want to give optimistic news. And so I will discuss with you what we can do to, to fix the country. And uh, the first recipe is actually simple, is competition, competition, competition. Uh, I can tell you that I experienced firsthand the benefit of this by seeing how organizations change. Um, the finance department of Bocconi, until 10 years ago, was nothing to be proud of. If you look at the statistics, even within Italy, it was pretty embarrassing how low it was in productivity. Now is one of the best in Europe. Why this happened? Rule number one, because Bocconi used to be kind of a monopoly in Italy. And uh, they were saying, why do we need to change? We have all the best students and there is no need to change. All of a sudden, students started to actually go abroad even for undergraduate. The market opened up, thanks actually to the European Union, the market opened up and people now come to school in the United States, in, in England, in a lot of other places. And Bocconi realized all of a sudden that uh, the biggest advantage of, of it all that was, Bocconi was one of the few institutions that recruited nationally in Italy. Uh, I grew up in, in little Padova, and uh, when I finished high school, I decided to go to Bocconi. And my mother looked at me and said, what's wrong with us? Why are you want to leave the family to go to a different town? And I said, I just want to go to the best place. Nothing uh, against you. I love you guys, but uh, this is my life, and I want to go to the best place. And uh, at the time, I was reasoning just in terms of Italy. Uh, today's generation uh, look at at least Europe, if not the world. And so Bocconi realized that they had to change. And that was the number one rule. The number, one, the number two secret, uh, which is a, a little known secret of Bocconi, is that control rights are extremely concentrated. So, is not like other universities, not in Italy, that of course mostly are public, but not even in the United States. Here there is a board of directors, there are a lot of constituency, etc. Uh, the control of Bocconi resides in the Association Friends of Bocconi, composed of five people, four of which are above 90, and Mario Monti. Okay? <laughs> so basically, Mario Monti has control rights, has no cash flow rights, but has control rights over Bocconi. And he decided at some point he, the things needed to change. And you know, when you have concentrated control and somebody decides to change, sort of uh, uh, you, you do it. But the third thing that was crucial is, is uh, uh, Monti had the insight to choose as, uh, as a first dean to make this transition, uh, Guido Tabellini, who is not only a great economist, but also a great manager. And he understood how to make this transition, creating the right incentives, and not creating uh, an enormous disruption in the organization. So uh, I think that good quality management is extremely important to promote the change. And uh, let me actually end with a, a po another positive story. Uh, this guy is uh, Nicola Calandrea, and he is the manager of the Barilla plant in Bari. And the story goes as follows, and it's a beautiful story told by uh, actually uh, the podcast Planet Money, uh, which I strongly recommend because it's a fantastic source of uh, uh, economic analysis. So the Planet Money wanted to compare the north with the south of Europe. So they decided to do the obvious thing, which is compare to the north and south of Italy. And uh, if you talk about Italy, of course, you talk about pasta. If you talk about pasta, you talk about Barilla. So they decided to compare a plant in the north of, of Italy, Parma, with a plant in the south of Italy, uh, in, in Bari. And the story starts as, in a way that is fairly common, uh, I'm afraid too common for us Italian, which is the northern plant is more productive than the southern plant. And why is more productive? They use the same technology. Uh, the difference is that there is more absenteeism in the south than in the north. So much absenteeism that at some point Barilla is in doubt whether they can keep the plant there. Because as you all know, today 
uh, much of the work is done by machine. So there are huge fixed investments uh, to produce this pasta, and the return was not there. So uh, how can they actually uh, do uh, the difference? And uh, they gave it a last try, and they sent it, this guy, to actually manage the, the plant in Bari. And this guy, uh, first of all, uh, was different than uh, most uh, traditional managers in, in Italy, which is actually uh, care about the employees and spend time with the employees at uh, lunch and dinner with the employees, felt one of them. And then he tried to fix the problem uh, the old-fashioned way. He started to uh, send an inspector to people who did not show up, but also the inspector were colluded with a worker, so he sent an inspector of the inspector, and pretty quickly understood that uh, there was no way out, okay? If you follow that path, there is no way out. So he followed a different path. First of all, explain to the workers, you know, guys, not my fault, but if things don't change here, we close down the plant because it's not productive enough. Uh, we can move to Albania, lower cost, and uh, uh, equal productivity for us as Barilla is the way to go. So again, competition is forcing change. And this is extremely credible and extremely painful because if you are in Bari, your next best job is not great if it is a job at all. The second point, he actually used social pressure. He collected the statistics of who was not showing up for work and the statistics of the doctor, doctors who are signing the certificate of the people who are not showing up for work. And he realized that in a large plant, uh, the number of people that were not showing up was relatively limited and were very highly concentrated but the number of doctors that were signing those certificates was even more concentrated. So he did something very interesting. He sent a memo to everybody, including the doctors, with the statistics, trying to point out that, you know, guys, uh, it's not a fight between capital and labor. It's not a fight between boss and workers. It's a fight between the people who want to work and the people who don't want to work. And unfortunately, we find people of the second type both places. But in this particular case, Nicola was a very dedicated uh, manager and a very credible manager. And then happened the key moment. The key moment was a guy wanted to uh, take a day off to actually play a soccer match. And uh, he asked for a day off. They say no. And he called himself sort of uh, sick. Unfortunately, he was not that sick because he played the next day and actually scored two goals. And the irony of this is the team was actually sponsored by Barilla. Um, <laughs> and, and his picture ended up in the local newspaper. So uh, it was not like a secret. Now, the important element is that one of the employees, not one of management, one of the employees went to Nicola and say, you see this picture? This guy was not that sick. This is the guy who undermines us, okay? And the point is not so much that this guy got fired. The point was that all of a sudden, the social norm was not to uh, screw the factory. The social norm was let's work hard to fix the problem. And the good news is that today, at least at the time this podcast was done, today that plant is more productive than the one in the north. So the, the idea that we cannot change, the idea that the north and southern difference cannot change is wrong. You can change it. However, change requires a number of, of factors, requires competitive pressure, and unfortunately at the moment in Italy we're more than enough, uh, requires a sense of desperate situation, and we're doing great on that front in Italy, uh, requires good leadership. This is where you are desperately need to do that. But also requires understanding how you change social norms. Because unfortunately, the biggest obstacle in my view of Italy is the social norm prevailing are not social norms that promote competition, productivity, hard work, 
a social norm that protects the lazy, the people who think they are smarter, uh, the, the i furbi, as we say in Italian, and it's hard to translate this term in English because it's not a very popular sort of a group of people and a group of people who want to be labeled with a name, okay? So it is very important that you remember this while maintaining the strong Italian tradition. I think Italy is great in many, many things, starting with the food we've seen this morning with Ferrero. And I want to say, speaking of remembering the Italian tradition, uh, the guy, the organizer here had a wonderful idea. At lunch, uh, we're going to have pasta alla matriciana, pasta to remember sort of uh, our tradition, but also alla matriciana to remember the places that have been hit by the earthquake. And I think there is a desperate need in Italy to, uh, of you to start from your tradition, but innovate where it needs to be innovated. And the first place is management, and in particular, the culture of management. And I hope that all of you can do that. Thank you.